Great, well, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm really glad to be speaking at this very interesting workshop. And indeed, this talk is going to be about massive color kinematics duality. And let me just briefly say by this, I mean uh, massive mediators and uh, well defined double copies. And by well defined, I mean only physical poles and correct factorization. And this is based on two, a series of works, one with a set of people at the University of Pennsylvania with Xu Liang and Mark Trodden, and the other one, a series of papers with Arshmo Memi and Justin Rambutis. And let me just highlight briefly these um, two grad students that are excellent and will be applying for postdocs in the next round. And meanwhile, Justin is Rambutis that will be going to National Taiwan University. So let's start again, like everyone, without motivating why we care about the double copy and why it is interesting to see if we can generalize it to the massive case because everyone here knows the reasons. So I'll just uh, give a short review of some work that has already been done on understanding um, what is the color kinematics duality for massive mediators, which was started in these papers by these two different groups. And here I'm going to be focusing on the PCJ style double copy. Uh, if you want to look at a more KLT approach, you can look at the papers by this group of people. So the idea here is just start with your standard PCJ representation for a Jacobian amplitude, so the following. But instead of just having your standard propagators given by your Mendelstein variable, for example, at four points, uh, you will go to S plus M squared. So you just have a massive mediator. So you will define it as usual in this form. And now I'm gonna introduce a matrix notation that will be useful for explaining what issues can arise. So basically the C's now are gonna be a vector. His D matrix is gonna contain all these propagators and N is gonna be the kinematics vector. So for reference, this D in the uh, four point massless case would be the diagonal matrix of S, D, and U. Now, if we have that this theory satisfies color kinematics duality, like in the massless case, we will construct our double copy as usual by exchanging our color by our kinematics, and we will define this as our double copy, which in our matrix notation now looks like the following. Now let's introduce some extra notation again with this matrix notation, but for the Jacobi relationships that are satisfied for these color factors. So now I'm calling this matrix M, and this, which would be, again, let's go to the simplest case, um, which is the four point, uh, sorry, massless case. That matrix M would look like the following. And your C would look like a CS, CP, CU, which just gives you your standard CS plus CP plus CQ is equal zero. So basically M has only uh, NJ rows, which is NJ the number of Jacobi relationships you will have at N points. Now, if you have a generic massive theory, you will immediately see that these kinematic numerators don't satisfy the analog. So basically you find M and is not zero, which you will immediately think, okay, there's nothing for us to do here, but there's actually something that saves you in the massive case. And if you go and look at what the changes are under generalized case transformations, which are the following form, which as you know, leave the Jane Mills amplitude invariant. And this is due to the color factor satisfying these Jacobi relations. So that means that when I plug in this in here, in my matrix notation, now this delta N should be defined by this equation right here. So when this M transpose here is this C transpose, this is gonna be simply zero. So now we can look at what happens to this, um, MN that we had before, which basically measures if you have the color kinematics duality or not. And under this generalized gauge transformations, it will change in the following way. So if you have that this extra factor is non-zero, you could now get a representation where it satisfies color kinematics duality. And in fact, for the massive case, you can see that this happens for any theory which immediately tells you that something must be wrong because we know that we cannot double copy any theory and obtain something reasonable. And just so you see again, for the massive 
for the massless case, what happens? The fact is that this is going to be equal to zero. And that is because if you just uh, actually use this matrix M that I uh, wrote here, you will see that the only non zero component is given by the trace of B, which is just S plus D plus U, which gives you zero. So in the massless case, this would be zero. In the massive, instead, you will have S replaced by S plus M squared and so on. And then you will get something non zero and you can have color kinematics duality for any theory. So there's something weird happening here in this massive case. Now the question is, okay, we can always have color kinematics duality, but what happens to the double copy? And it was already shown that there could be issues and these issues will arise at five points. So let's again review this briefly. And in this language, as we saw, if we want this shift the numerators to satisfy color kinematics duality, we need that this uh, relationship be satisfied. And I forgot to mention this B is just any vector that satisfies the relationships above. So to find our double copy, we want to find actually what our B is to find what our shifted numerators are. But also, as I showed you, this has a lot of uh, zero components. So to obtain what B is, we need to invert this part. So we need to actually reduce to what's the non-zero components, which um, in this extra notation I'm adding here, I'm gonna call this the non-zero part of A and the non-zero part of this U. So U basically measures by how much um, your color kinematics duality is violated in your theorem. So now you can just invert this relation and plug it back in in your double copy. So here, instead of having this S, you will have the shifted Ns with the delta N given by this formula. And you will find that the double copy now it's given by the following. So you have the standard piece that you will get in your standard BCJ, and you have an extra piece that comes from the shifting of the numerators. And you see immediately that it comes with the neighbors of a matrix, which tells you that you could have some spurious poles arising from this matrix. So just to highlight, this is the important part. Now at four points, as I mentioned, um, this is just gonna be the non-zero part is the trace of S plus M squared, D plus M squared, U plus M squared, and it just gives you something that doesn't give you any extra spurious poles. But at five points, it was already noticed that um, this gives you a polynomial that depends on Mendelssohn variables and masses, and actually gives you some spurious poles. These are not physical, and this leads you to a theory that it's um, not local and nothing that you will expect of a double copy. So now the question is, how to avoid these spurious poles? What are the theories that have a well-defined double copy? And there are actually two directions that you can take that we know at least so far. And the first one is we consider some sort of spontaneous symmetry breaking. So you start with a massless theory and you break certain symmetries of arising in this theory and you get something that's massive. And this is, for example, the case in spontaneous symmetry break is in supergravities, which has been seen by the following people. And also in kaluza claim theories, um, since when you compactify the extra dimensions, you break some of the 5D diffeomorphisms. So this case, um, I'm gonna focus on for the first part of my talk. And in this case, the requirement basically is to remove this spurious pulse comes to some relationship of the, the massive spectral condition. So this spectral condition that I'm writing over here, basically tells you that if you look at a four point scattering, the sum of the external masses, it's gonna be equal to the sum of the masses that are exchanged in each channel. And notice that this has the assumption that you are only exchanging one mass per channel. And now you can actually apply this spectral condition to having in higher point graphs or like in a five point, every sub four point graph that you can construct should also satisfy this and so on. And in principle, this will immediately give you that the determinant of that matrix that I mentioned before is A would be zero, so you cannot invert it. So that means that you just have uh, some null directions in your matrix, which will correspond to BCGA relations. And in fact, in both of these cases, what you have is that you have extra relationships within your amplitudes. In fact, at five points, you have four of them. And this is just analogous to the 
massless case. So in these cases, everything is very similar to what happens in the massless case. You have four BCG relations, then you can actually construct a double copy in the standard way. And yeah, um, you get what you expect now for these massive cases. Um, what I'm gonna focus on now, it's gonna be another case, which is a cubic scalar EFD, which doesn't immediately have an origin in a higher dimensional massless theory, but it might. But I'll show you how you can get something else besides just these theories. The second option um, is to go for 3D kinematics. So we just had a very nice talk by Nathan mentioning um, a lot of how you can get topologically massive theories as a double copy. And in this case, the fact that you have 3D kinematics actually implies that the determinant of that matrix A that I've been showing you before actually becomes zero. And this is because that polynomial that I mentioned has some structure and it's actually the gram determinant of the momenta dotted like this for i and j, um, only four of the five momenta in five points, which means that you have something proportional to something antisymmetric with four indices. So in 3D, it must be zero. Now this gives you only one null vector of your matrix A, which means that you only have something that is we can call one BCJ relation. And I put it on quotes because it's, it doesn't look at all like the BCG relations that we're used to in the massless case. And in principle, you would think since you only have one instead of four, this is not enough, but it is. And you get that you have no spurious poles and the correct factorization channels at five points. And the double copy for topologically massive theories works at least up to five points that we checked. So now let me move on actually to see the details of both of these theories. And the first part will be this cubic scalar EFT. Okay, so the idea here is let's consider a um, massive tower of ions or basically colored scalars and see if we can create like the most general EFT for these massive ions. And if it satisfies color kinematics duality, can we double copy to something sensible? So the, the easy answer to, for this is, again, I mean, we know Kalusa claim must work. So we know massive ions, if you square them, should give you massive special Galileans. That would be no surprise. The question is, can there be more operators that satisfy this? And this question is motivated actually on work that was done um, by these people by looking at Kalusa claim theories actually in gravity context. And the idea in their paper was, um, take all the operators that will arise from the Kaluza clean reduction. Now detune all the interactions. So you just have now random Wilsonian coefficients for each operator. And assume that you have to satisfy the PCJ relations. And what happens, uh, which I guess could be expected is that you have to go back to Kaluza clean and that's the only option. But that's only restricting to the set of operators that arise from Kaluza clean. So the question that's open is what happens if you include other operators besides those arising from a dimensional reduction? And of course in gravity and in young mills, this is complicated to write down because of their spin and polarization structures, but for massive, massive, uh, for massive scalars, it's actually easy. And we can easily write all the EFD operators that are missing and see if any of those could actually satisfy the BCJ relations. So this is what we did in the following paper. And to avoid spurious poles here, we assume again, the spectral condition is gonna be satisfied. So let me just briefly review um, what is the idea with Kaluza clean reduction and why you immediately get a double copy that's sensible for your um, massive theories. Basically for Kaluza claim, you consider a five dimensional space and R4 plus one and compactify one of the fifth spatial dimensions in a circle. So your field can be expanded now in modes that look like the following where only you have an arbitrary dependence on 4D, but you have special modes in the fifth direction. And that means that the momenta now, your 5D momenta can be split into your 4D and now the fifth momenta is just the mass, which is related to something that Nathan was mentioning before. If you want to do this form dimensional reductions, you basically just pick one of the 
directions of your momenta and send it through the mass. And in fact, this immediately proves uh, for the scalar case why the amplitudes uh, of the Kalisa claim should satisfy VCJ. And that is because um, the KK amplitudes um, are given as functions of these S tilde variables that I'm calling them, uh, which is just your standard Mendel's terms minus uh, the masses of the mediators of the interactions. They're equal to the amplitudes of the massless case in 5D, but replacing this um, 5D Mandel stem by this 4D Mandel stem. And this is just, again, dimensional reduction of the momenta. And since we already know that the massless one satisfies VCJ relations in the massless case, the massive ones will satisfy VCJ relations in the massive case because the VCJ relations in the massive case are basically the same as in the massless case, again, taking S to this S tilde. So in this setup with the spectral condition, you have so many similarities to, to what you expect from the massless case, basically everything taking S to S tilde will be satisfied. Now, we already know um, which are the most general amplitude satisfying VCJ relations for the massless case. And if you're gonna have a KK reduction in this way, it's gonna be exactly the same with these variables as tilde. So in principle, it seems like you're not getting anything new. You shouldn't have anything beyond calut cycling reduction. Um, but the only caveat here is that those things that we know for the massless case, we're only considering uh, just one set of particles. So it's one pi on if you want with n different colors, but that's it. And if you remember here, I'm considering a theory that satisfies the massive spectral conditions, which means that I have a massive tower of fields. And this massive tower of fields gives you extra freedom of what interactions you can have. So that's what we are gonna exploit, this extra freedom of having a whole massive tower for each uh, color order scalar. And before moving on, let me just point out for those that are actually familiar with the special Galileo, that in five dimensions, you will have extra contributions from now um, six point amplitude. But again, from this uh, simpler dimensional reduction argument, you will see that even though they are non-zero in 5D, since in 4D you have to replace them by the 4D kinematics, they will immediately be zero. So there is actually, again, nothing new in this calus reduction. So now let's actually see uh, what is the new thing you can get. So we're gonna use the freedom of having an infinite tower of massive states. And let me just write explicitly how these interactions would look that we're proposing for our EF team. And the idea is basically you have here F, like the pi and the K constant simply for a dimensional um, analysis for your Lagrangian, your standard color factor, uh, these are going to be your pi and fields where A, B, C are just the colors. And now N1, N2, and N3 are the labels for the masses. So they go from zero to infinity. And now you can have different strength of interactions between different massive states. So in principle, we usually just consider this to be one and every massive state has the same kind of interaction. But you can consider now uh, this extra factor that has to be cyclic and symmetric for a three-point amplitude. And it just tells you that the coupling strain between different massive states could be different. So what we're gonna try to do is to exploit this freedom and see if we can get a new set of theories that still satisfies BCJ relations, but it's different from just a Galutza claim reduction from a nonlinear sigma model. And indeed what we find is that this is possible. So just, uh, a quick mention of how you do this is by looking again at the BCJ relations that would arise from this kind of interactions. And at four point, for example, you get this relationship between these factors that if you actually look at it carefully, it, it looks exactly like a Jacobi relationship, which is not surprising because this could be something like a Biagen scalar if you want. But there's a big difference here. Um, and is that we're considering infinite towers of massive states. So this um, 
if you wanted to consider something that's cyclic and symmetric and satisfy something like a Jacobi relation and you wanted to say, okay, it's an infinite dimensional Lie group, this would not be possible because for infinite dimensional Lie groups, their structure constants are not anti-symmetric. So you cannot do that. Um, but instead, instead of thinking of this um, as a sum and considering it as a Jacobi relationship, you can just assume again, there's only certain fixed number of um, mediators that, so there's only certain fixed number of one, two states and one, three states over here. And then you can satisfy this relation. And basically the idea is that this is just one relation and you have six free parameters. And then you can go on to the five point BCJ and there are four BCJ relations, but they're actually only gonna give you one extra constraint. And you can keep moving on to higher and higher point amplitudes and you will see that there's always enough freedom to satisfy the BCJ relations, depending on how many uh, interaction vertices you have involved. So this tells you that you can have a cubic theory with a specially tuned um, set of coupling strengths. So basically each coupling strength should be tuned in certain specific way that can satisfy BCJ relations. And once you do that, you may think, okay, I can have cubic interactions. Can I go to four point interactions and do the same and higher points? And actually, no, the answer is no. In that case, you don't have enough freedom. The BCJ relations impose too many constraints and you cannot do it. So this is the only case um, that will satisfy again BCJ relations. Another thing is that you cannot combine these cubic interactions with the ones arising from the KK reduction of the nonlinear sigma model. They're not compatible with the BCJ relation. So it's like a separate theory that can be double copied. So um, we don't know if there's any special symmetries. We don't know exactly what it is, but just as an example of something else, it is <laughs> this case. So now I'm gonna switch gears and go to the other option for avoiding spurious pulls. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know now about the scalar theories. Uh, hi, can I ask you an elementary question? Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, at the beginning, very beginning, when you define the massive color kinematic duality, I would, uh, what, is there a, I mean, more than just uh, use extension that we use it the same way as defining for the massless case. Because for the massive, I mean, if I have, think of Prokop, I mean, gauge symmetry is also not straightforward, right? So maybe we should modify the color kinematic duality for the massive case or, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree that we're doing it equivalent to what we know for the massless case. And as far as we know, um, we don't know how to modify it if you want through something different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, I, I understand, like, it, there's no obvious reason that it has to be the same. But if the color factors don't change, though, so the color factors satisfy the same algebraic relations. So you would expect your kinematic factors satisfy the same. But perhaps the way that we do the double copy that is exactly like BCJ, there could be a different way. I mean, is, is there one can try to make symmetric argument because when I end up with massive spin two stuff, if I double copy and massive spin one, or then the symmetry is not, or what is the local diffuse, or I don't know, is there a relation between the symmetries of the original theories and the resulting double copy and the color kinematic duality that one can use to understand this thing? Well, in the massive case, it, it depends. If you're just looking at a massive Yang Mills, your gauge symmetries are broken. So it, that is not uh, it, same with the massive gravity. So, I mean, that's a reason why the political massive gauge theories might be something special because they still have gauge symmetries. But otherwise, I wouldn't know um, how to map symmetries between these massive theories. And when they Thanks. arise from spontaneous symmetry breakings, um, well, yeah, again, you do know how to map the symmetries. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so Luckily for me, Nathan already introduced this topologically massive T 
theories, so I don't have to go into much detail. Uh, but just maybe to set up my notation, which I think it's a bit different, let me just give you what is the action for topologically massive gravity and topologically massive jet wheels that I'm considering here. So these theories um, basically consider um, einstein hilbert term plus a gravitational churn simons in the gravitational side. And for the jet mill side, we just have our standard jet mill spark plus uh, a churn simons. Now this churn simons term breaks parity. So as Nathan mentioned, instead of having for a massive uh, jet mills field, what you would expect to be two degrees of freedom, you only have one degree of freedom. And the helicity is given by the sign of the mass here. And it's the same for the topologically massive graviton. So basically, in terms of degrees of freedom, you're doing a one cross one equal to one degree of freedom. Um, now, in terms of why we avoid spurious poles in this case, so I briefly mentioned it before, but maybe let me go into a bit of more detail. So as we had before, if we take these shifted numerators that actually satisfy the color kinematics duality, so we have the standard part, and then we have this extra um, correction where this matrix A, if you remember, is just the non-zero part of this, where M is um, giving you the Jacobi relations, and D is the matrix giving you the propagators. So we saw that in three dimensions, this determinant is going to be zero. And the fact that the determinant is zero implies that A has a null vector, which I'm denoting here in odd. And this in naught um, will satisfy the following BCJ relation. If it satisfies this BCJ relation, that means um, that we can um, take our theory and only get what would be the non zero part of this A and do the same procedure as before to find the shifted numerators. Now, this BCJ relation, as I mentioned, is not going to look anything at all like what we had before of just extend our BCA relations. So here I'm defining it in terms of this U, which basically has these kinematic factors, but it can be also rewritten in terms of the partial amplitudes if you want like a standard BCA relation. But again, it doesn't look anything at all like what your massless BCA relations are. And you cannot do like an S to S tilde and just get this relationship. What in principle, just having one BCJ relation and having the rank of this A not being equal to the rank of A for the masses theory will uh, worry you that this is not gonna give you a well-defined double copy. But in fact, we have checked that this um, amplitude will factorize correctly when SIJ is zero and the residues of the spurious poles which still seem to be present are actually zero. So there is actually no spurious pole and everything's correct and well-defined. But um, what I want to talk about now is uh, what happens now when you include matter and how this can be also related to classical solutions. So this is gonna be probably a bit similar to what Nathan talked about in the previous talk, but maybe from a slight different perspective. So let's consider now um, what would be the scattering of just a um, massive scalar through a topologically massive young Mills field. So here, these dotted lines, just assume the um, massive scalars with mass M, and they're gonna have the same mass as our topologically massive young Mills field, which will be of mass M. So if I just look at this four point scattering and do the standard BC procedure to square it, we actually find that um, this again gives you the scattering of massive scalars with mass M at topologically massive gravity with mass M, but there is an extra term which we were able to identify with a contact term of a scalar field. Um, in Nathan's talk, we saw that this kind of scattering actually for him gives you something extra also on the double copy side, but in his case, he was able to identify it with a massless graviton. For us, it seems that you need a contact term interaction. So um, I would say in general, what happens with the double copy when you are scattering in matter, at least for topologically massive fields, 
it's not entirely known what's in this <laughs> site. Of course, this is not only the case in massive theories. We know that there are also issues uh, with including just any random matter that you have want in the massless case. So in principle, you will think there's no obvious reason why you would expect that the double copy holds again here. But um, one thing to notice is that if this is a contact term, which means that it is subleading in a high energy limit. So I can take the icona limit, and now my double copy would work perfectly. And this was also observed that something similar happens with taking um, matter also that has um, traceless trace energy tensor, which means it's like null matter. So high energy limit, null matter means that our double copies are going to be behaving just like we want it. So this is something we analyzed in this paper. So what happens with this double copy in the icona limit? So now let me. Um, briefly review what the icona limit is and how to look at the double copy and why you would expect something quite simple. Um, so as most people know, in the icona limit, we basically have uh, that the transfer momenta T is much smaller than the total energy S, which is also of the order of U. We're also considering that the mass of our mediator is much smaller than this S. And that means that uh, the graphs that are going to be contributing to our amplitudes are basically just ladder graphs and cross ladder graphs. And you just have a series of all of these graphs in our kernel limit. Now, it is possible to show that the sum of all of these graphs, which give you the iconal amplitude, so now you're including also loops, um, can exponentiate in the standard way, which is the following. So this has been shown for any field theory with any spin. But it hadn't been shown explicitly for the politically massive theories. And we actually showed that this exponentiation also works in our case. And again, with the caveat that you assume that the icona limit just means contribution from ladders and cross ladders. So now that you have this exponentiation in terms of this um, simple integral over um, B, which the, is the impact parameter, and now e to the i delta, where delta is your um, icon of phase shift here, given in terms of only the three level four point amplitude, we can try to understand how to do a simple double copy. And in fact, in 4D, this has been checked and it is extremely simple. You basically just take the color factor and exchange it for uh, the Mandelstam variable S. And this takes your Jan Mills amplitude to your gravity amplitude, which is impressive. It's the simplest. Uh, <laughs> Um, replacement for color kinematics. And so now we want to know if there's something as simple happening for these topologically massive theories. And we're, we're going to see that that's not the case. But we can understand why. So if we take this exponential and actually do the series expansion and consider the end term of that expansion, well, in this case, the n minus 1 term, uh, for topologically massive um, electrodynamics, I'm going to consider here the linearized version. We're going to find that the amplitude looks the following way. So we have a color factor Q to the 2 to the n, then a kinematic factor in blue here, which is S uh, 1 minus m over square root of minus t. And then we have uh, our propagators that basically come from propagators arising here uh, in rungs in the ladder and also the massive propagators arising in this case. So these two contributions from rocks and from also the massive particle. So um, now we want to apply the same kind of polar kinematic replacement that has been seen to work in the icona limit uh, in the massless case, which would simply say Q squared now goes to this kinematic factor. But we immediately see that this is not going to be uh, a topologically massive gravity. And in principle, one could think, OK, this is an issue with um, our color kinematic replacements or the simplicity of how we're doing things. Or maybe there is something extra, right? Like we saw on the other case that we could have extra stuff here. But um, this is not the case. In fact, we can track it down that it's only uh, how an uh, artifact of how the massive double copy works. So remember here, the only thing that appears is the tree level. So let's just look at the tree level um, amplitude. And if we graph 
the scattering amplitude that have a tree level and take the iconal limit, the only channel that contributes is the T channel. So you usually have like the NT. But if you do this on the gravity side, and the double copy that we showed before, you have the standard contribution from your PCJ double copy, but you have this extra contribution. This extra contribution, if you remember, is um, that extra factor that I before mentioned that could arise um, some spurious pulse, but at four point, there's no spurious pulse because it's just uh, an M square. This does not vanish in the iconal limit. This factor is important. So doing just a simple replacement of Q to this would basically be only the NP squared part. So you're completely missing this part that matters from constructing the proper double copy. So this actually gives you a big question. Um, I don't know, so, some of these double copies that are we doing in the classical limit might not be as trivial as we think because you need to consider that the shift in numerators gives you an extra thing. So it's just not color to kinematics <laughs> and blank, that's it, right? You have extra stuff. And in Taikona limit, it even shows up because it doesn't vanish. So it tells you just that you need information outside of the Taikona limit to actually correctly do the double copy. Now, can I, can I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, are these numerators there, not the ones that satisfy the Jacobi identity? Yeah, these would be the ones that don't satisfy the Jacobi identity. The okay. original ones were okay, NS plus they, NT plus the original NS. ones? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so when you construct the double copy with the shifted ones, then you get this extra term instead of only this term. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's also why this part is not zero and, and it matters. <laughs> okay, so now I'm gonna um, relate this to classical solutions. So this is actually the last slide that contains anything related to scattering amplitudes. If anyone has any other questions? If not, um, I will go into classical solutions because um, from the kind of limit, as we know, this is closely related to scattering in a, of a point particle in a background. So now we can relate the scattering amplitudes that we computed before in the iconal limit. And assume now that instead of having a two to two scattering, you have one of these particles generating a background and the other particle is scattering of this background. So if you have this situation and you assume that your background will have the following shape where U and V are your standard like coordinates, then um, you can compute basically what will be your point particle scattering amplitude and you get the following. Basically, you can set it equal to the scattering amplitude you computed before in the field theory case, but adding the proper normalizations for your non-relativistic scattering for the point particle. And you can basically infer what would be your background. And it is well known that this background will correspond to a shock wave solution. But um, the form of this background and actually your exact result for the like, amplitude, it, it's not invariant. There's actually a choice of an I epsilon prescription. So when you put your scatter amplitude here, um, you basically need to pick an I epsilon prescription to actually do the integral. And you can also pick boundary conditions for your metric here and select your background. So, these boundary conditions on your classical side are equivalent to what is going to be your choice of R epsilon description of your phase shift. Now, the question is, if we want to see a double copy now in coordinate space for a classical solution, is there a specific I epsilon prescription or boundary conditions that allow us to see this? And we found that the answer is yes. This is the I epsilon prescription that we take. And I'll show you in the next slide what is basically um, the solution. So um, here again, I will refer to the Kershield double copy, which has been already mentioned in several talks, so I won't review exactly what it is. But um, for the gravity side, as you know, you will have your gravity given by a k mu k mu phi with k mu uh, null geodetic vector. And this phi 
in the gravitational case, if you just do the procedure that I told you before of matching scattering amplitudes, you will find that it's the following. You get your single copy by replacing a KMU by a color factor and your by during scalar again by replacing for another extra color factor. And each of the phi's could actually be given by this. But you can see um, that the double copy is actually valid only on one side of the stroke wave. So this is gonna be for my choices, the positive y direction where the double copy holds and each of these is e to the minus m y, just a plane wave basically on this side. Now a quick worry would be like what happens on the other side of the shock wave, but the answer is simple. Um, with this special choice of boundary conditions, you can see that um, what you have on the other side of the shock wave is actually trivial. This gives you a flat space. This gives you a zero field strength. So there's nothing actually to the world copy and there's nothing to worry about. Which also might tell you immediately that um, there's a better way of looking at the double copy that we discussion. And perhaps a, an important thing to mention is that we checked um, with the Kershaw landsats if you want to get a general double copy solution for topologically massive theories. The only solutions that you can have are of the form of plane waves. So you cannot get other kind of stationary solutions from a Kerr shield uh, double copy in topologically massive gravities because it, it requires your phi to be basically e to the minus my. So you're not gonna get anything else out of a Kerr shield double copy. Which immediately tells you, let's move on and see if there's a better way of doing this. Sorry, can, and, I, just ask a, can I just ask a question, Mariana? Yes. Um, so, why why does phi need to be of the form e to the minus m y? Uh, so basically, you have to plug in your Kirchhoff ansatz um, in your topologically massive equation of motions, and it does linearize them. Uh, but of, to actually find that, so in the standard mass massless case for gravity in Young Niels, you can find that Young Niels equations or well electrodynamics equations are encoded in Einstein's equations. And to find the same thing like that, the linearized topologically massive Jang Mills equations are encoded in the topologically massive um, gravity equations. You have to make certain choices. And at least what we found is that those choices imply that the only, um, only solution will be given if phi is proportional to e to the minus m y. So not like a modified Bessel function or something, something like that wouldn't work. Oh, sorry. Well, I mean, ugh, I don't know. We found- Because we found that's the stationary things. solutions, right? And they reduce yes. to the, these e to the minus and y in like the high energy limit or something. Ah, but... uh, so it's complicated. It, it might work. It might be that we only found the easiest case, but it, we would have to go. Yeah, I, I see what you mean. We will have to go to the equations of motion again and assume phi satisfies me with these modified basal equations and see if with that assumption you can uh, again see if the topologically massive young mills are encoded in topologically massive gravity. But yeah, since I think that's what I'd expect, but yeah, I don't know if. Uh, yeah, it, it is not easy to see. Interesting <laughs> to think about. It is not um, something I would say you will immediately look at the equations and be like, oh, if this phi satisfies this modified Bessel, then it works. So what, what was obvious for us to see is like, if phi is proportional to this exponential, then it works. But yeah, yeah. no, it, it will definitely be interesting to see that. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so almost to finish my talk, let me just mention uh, what was our inspiration for proposing the cotton double copy. So basically it's the idea that I mentioned before with the shock waves. And we saw that these shock waves will satisfy the following relationship, which is basically that the cotton um, tensor, which as Nathan showed appears in the equations of motion for topologically massive gravity, is given by the square of the field strength over this phi. And a question of why this relationship will hold um, can be answered by looking at linearized equations of motion for plane waves and basically since this cotton uh, tensor is, is given um, in the equations of motion of gravity, 
we could think of writing it as the square of the equations of motion, maybe of your topologically massive young meals. So since this would be a further p cube, now on the other side, you also need something of the same order. So your f would be order p, which means that you need something else of order p squared, which you would just naively construct, like add a nabla here and see what happens. But in fact, um, this nabla from the linearized equations of motion of topologically massive young mills gives you this factor of the mass times the dual field strength, which explains why you will get such relation. Um, so basically to conclude and not repeat much of what Nathan already said, we also have a cotton double copy, but now fully formulated on um, coordinate space, which is the analog of what the vial double copy is. Um, you get the cotton spinner now in terms of the dual field string spinner now with a mass term in front. And the equations of motion of these are just the massive analog of what would be the equation of motion in the massless case. Now for the cotton, here for the vial, here for the dual field strength, and here also with the mass. And this can be extended to um, curve space times where you just get this extra coupling here, which interestingly enough is the same as the 4D case, but in 3D is not conformally invariant. Yes, uh, an interesting fact. So we check this and we're actually able to prove that for type N solutions, so many wave solutions of this form, um, this double copy relationship will be satisfied. So we actually have like a straightforward proof. It's a little bit tedious to do, but you can prove it that if you have these solutions uh, that are type N, then they must be related in the following way by a scalar field that satisfies this equation of motion. And we checked a couple of cases such as shockwave solutions, gyrotons, and even ADS shockwaves. So let me just conclude to not go too much over time uh, by saying that the color kinematics duality, as we have seen, can be satisfied by all massive theories. But this doesn't mean that you can get double copies that are local and well-defined or anything you want. And I've shown you some examples of well-defined double copies, such as Galusa-Klein theories and a special cubic scalar theory, and also topologically massive theories. Then there are several open questions, such as what are the symmetries behind these cubic interactions? What happens when you include extra matter states? And of course, is there a twist or origin for this double copy? And that we're already working in progress with Nathan, um, Asha Romani, Justina Shrombutis, and Chris White. So thanks very much. Thanks for that. Thanks for that very nice talk. Um, are there any questions for Mariana? It looks like Tommaso has a question. Yeah, thank you, Mariana, for your talk. So regarding the first part of the talk with the five-dimensional theory reduced to a massive four-dimensional theory, is the dimensionality in that case playing um, a fundamental role or was just an example? Um, the only important thing is go from D to D minus one. Um, you can go from any D to D minus one. If, <laughs> but if you have a D to D minus two, you have more ways of compactifying your extra dimensions. And then I wouldn't know, I, 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 then I wouldn't say I know exactly a proof that everything will work. And uh, another question, uh, are maybe a general reasons to think that if a massive theory manifests color kinematic duality, then this theory can be obtained with dimensional reduction for, from a massless theory with color kinematic uh, duality at the yeah, ins, uh, toward... yeah, well, that, that, that's a question I've been trying to answer. And that's why I, I try to construct like the purpose of these cubic scalar theories is to understand if they could be something that doesn't arise from dimensional reduction. Uh, but, but it's an open question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>